Thank you very much um, for this warm welcome. I'm delighted to be here um, this afternoon. Um, I must say that every time that I'm invited to universities, I tell myself maybe in a previous life I must have been a professor or something. Because I, it just brings calm to me. I, I enjoy the company. I enjoy the give and take of the rich intellectual discussion. And that's what I had this morning uh, with all of you. Um, I um, would like to congratulate um, uh, Vigil. I do not know that you say Vigil, but I'm learning fast. And the J.B. Moore Society of International Law for hosting this very important event. Um, I'm delighted to join uh, the moderators, the students, the panelists, everyone who is here uh, in these uh, discussions. Um, I liked very much the topic that has been chosen by the, organiza the organizers um, of this conference. Uh, for me, discussing crossing borders in international development um, and rethinking international development is something actually personal for me. Um, I come from a small country in West Africa called Senegal. Um, it is a developing country. Um, and uh, when someone talks about rethinking international development, I'm thinking immediately of those people who are um, close and dear to me back in my own home, uh, home country. I think of those people in Africa uh, that I know, the continent that I have crisscrossed, and uh, think of simple, the simple people who need the development that we are talking about in intellectual circles here and elsewhere. So uh, it is, to me, a personal honor to be part of any intellectual discussion in this area, because beyond that personal honor, it is something that is very deep uh, in me. So I would like to focus on a couple of um, areas and share my thoughts um, in respect of this topic that you have chosen. Um, I would like to focus on the nexus between governance and anti-corruption, human rights, and development. Um, first, the context. We all know that the changing landscape of international development means that an increasingly interconnected world is facing shared challenges which require coordinated responses and co cooperation. And amid these developments, uh, there is the threat of emerging norms that is discernible signaling shared values, including human rights, good governance, rule of law, and justice. Uh, here I would like to refer to Nobel Prize winning economist Professor Amartya Sen, who pioneered the concept of development as a freedom. Because I think that when he published that book, uh, that was a moment in development thinking. Um, in development as a freedom, Sen projected development as a process of expanding real freedoms or removing major sources of what he calls unfreedoms. And he demonstrated a strong correlation between poverty and freedom. He argued that poverty is not just lack of income or savings, but lack of freedom, lack of control over the decisions that shape one's life, about being at the whim of forces beyond one's control. And I believe that governance and anti-corruption are integral to this. Uh, so too is the realization of human rights because they address key determinants of freedom, whether through promoting the requisite social and economic justice or protecting civil liberties. They are thus extremely important to the pursuit of development. So let me turn first to governance and anti-corruption. In our technocratic, uh, Parlance, we say GAC. <laughs> I'm so sorry for using that term, but governance and corruption <laughs> sounds much nicer, right? Um, poor governance and, cor and corruption often go hand in hand, as you know, because poor governance inadvertently leads to or forces corruption, and corruption often is indicative of poor governance. And the consequences of poor governance and corruption cut across borders and include reduced investment. Our colleague from uh, uh, MCC uh, talked about the circumstances under which they come into a country. So if a country does not have good governance, it is unlikely that uh, they would be coming in. So reduction in, in investment, therefore. Lack of respect for the rule of law and human rights, 
failure in the delivery of public goods and services, inequality, exclusion and lack of opportunities, which in turn result in or enforce capture of the state and society by uh, the elite or the corrupt. Uh, let me share one example drawn from, from experience, uh, uh, case studies that we were doing in Sierra Leone. Um, in a clinic in Moyamba district in southern Sierra Leone, mothers stand in line with their infants to receive free immunizations provided by the government. That's a very important health benefit for uh, women and children, as well as a hopeful picture in a country that is considered one of the least safe places for a woman to give birth and has a high rate of um, infant mortality. However, it was discovered that as each mother uh, gets to the front of the line, the nurse would demand six cups of rice before administering the immunization. The mother is therefore forced to either comply or if you cannot or you don't want to, you lose the benefit. So the implication of this corrupt act in a context of weak governance go beyond deprivation of access to and enjoyment of this simple health benefit. It also constitutes an impediment to the right to food and the right to life. So interesting example to just illustrate something that happens not only in Sierra Leone, but in many parts of the world where you see governance impacting human, human, human rights and uh, all the freedoms. Um, in this uh, area of um, governance and anti-corruption, you all know that there has been a great deal of evolution in thinking. From 1996, when the then president of the World Bank, James Wolfenson, uh, talked about what he called the cancer of corruption. There has been a, a, a growth in this area. A lot has been, uh, has been written. But what is uh, uh, new is that these issues of anti-corruption and uh, governance are now being perceived and approached as a global problem, which poses serious threats to economic growth in both developed and developing nations. And to illustrate the, this global dimension, I, sh I would like to mention our updated governance and anti-corruption strategy that uh, was adopted by the World Bank in uh, 2012. Uh, in adopting the strategy, the, the bank pointed to the reasons, the, 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 the five elements that led it as an institution to revisit its 2007 strategy. And these were the following. The impact of the financial crisis on economies and governance globally, uh, a spate of civil society movements protesting against marginalization from economic opportunities and growth, the rise of social media as a fundamental driver of transformation in social and political relationship, and an increasing understanding on the parts of governments that greater participation by citizens and correcting disparities in status and opportunities between men and women will be critical to governing in the 21st century. You look at the list, all of these issues are global issues. And that is what is pushing this institution to revisit how it is approaching governance in the 21st century. Um, but we are not uh, the only actor in this area. There are plenty of actors. And because of the global dimension of this issue, what you see is that international and national actors, state and non-state actors, are becoming more and more actively involved in promoting good governance and combating corruption. And this is playing out at different levels. Uh, one that is extremely important that I would like to, to, to uh, say a few things about is the concept of citizen engagement. Um, we all followed what happened in Ukraine a few days ago. A few years ago, we all followed what happened in the, in the Arab world. Um, cities, the concept of citizen engagement and citizens taking uh, their own destiny in their hands is a phenomenon that is important and I think that is with us for a while. As this is going to help reshape many of the ways in which uh, governments are approaching their role. Uh, Accountability, trust in government, and integrity in public life are uh, the new things that uh, uh, these citizens are talking about. Um, in the Arab world, uh, or in countries like India and Brazil, where you have very strong um, anti-corruption movements, to even in the West, the Occupy movement, 
there is a groundswell of citizens' movement signaling frustra frustration with the seeming inability of governments to handle increasingly complex global problems of poverty, joblessness, fiscal crisis, and environmental vulnerability. And therefore, uh, there is a growing focus on closer interaction between citizens and the state, the aim being to promote processes that strengthen citizen participation in policy making, as well as institution uh, and mechanisms that strengthen oversight and accountability. Um, in addition to that citizen uh, engagement, there is another dimension also of the response, which is uh, the move towards a new social contract. Um, as citizens are seeking a relationship with their governments based on transparency, accountability, and participation, the state is also responding. Um, and this is leaving, leading to a move towards greater transparency, openness, and uh, improved uh, engagement of citizens. Uh, one example is uh, the initiative called Open Government Partnership, which was launched in 2011. And uh, 44, 43 countries signed it at the time. It is a multilateral initiative launched by several heads of states in the United Nations, uh, geared toward uh, involving more the citizenry in a variety of countries around the world uh, in the way their governments function. It is about good governance and about empowering the citizens to be actually watching what government is doing and the government's committing to having a third party watch what, what, what they are doing. Um, this is at the international level, but even at the level of national governments, a lot is happening around the world. Maybe not always uh, uh, mentioned in the press uh, here or elsewhere, but uh, uh, for those who follow this, you take the example of Kenya. Um, Kenya uh, was at the forefront, uh, as, as you may know, some years ago, of a new social contract that was reflected in the constitution that the Kenyans adopted after a couple of years of intense debate. And I think that today, one reads the constitution of Kenya, maybe it is one of the best constitutions in the world. Sorry, I'm in America. I know that uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but you know, when I read it, I said to myself, "Wow!" And this was, uh, you know, the culmination of years of really vigorous debate in the country uh, between the elites, between the regular people, civil society. Everyone was involved. They came up with something that they were very proud of. Yes, it was tested. Uh, immediately after after that, uh, uh, when they had the controversial elections, but I think that they are on their way, and the Kenyans have developed many uh, other mechanisms. For example, there is an e-tool application called Ushahidi uh, that is uh, helping map reports of violence in Kenya. Um, in Jordan, uh, there is something called Ishki.com, a complaints uh, brokerage facility which collects and organizes complaints from local citizens about the public and private sectors. In India, as we all know, pressure from a powerful civil society movement intensified actions to a series of accountability reforms. And one can continue. There are many going on uh, from Cambodia to Bosnia, Cameroon, Mexico, etc. So this is what, this was at the level of uh, individual states, but internationally we also know that um, the recognition of the urgent need to respond globally to the problem of corruption as a pervasive problem that um, uh, transcends national borders. Um, a lot of um, international um, uh, conventions have been developed, and I should I would want to mention just um, a few. That are internationally that are binding international corruption in, in, instruments. The UN Convention Against um, Corruption, uh, the convention spearheaded by the African Union, uh, the older one, the OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, uh, the Organization of American States. Um, there are a few of those that signal the willingness of the international community to say these um, issues go across borders, so we need to have a concerted international action to, to, to tackle them. Um, in my own organization, um, as I mentioned, governance and anti-corruption have been put on the top of the agenda uh, from something that a few experts who were 
handling, um, we developed a major strategy, and uh, as of July 1, uh, we are launching something that will be called the, global, the Governance Global Practice, which might end up being the largest, uh, uh, the largest unit in the bank, with all uh, experts coming from uh, uh, the law, from economics, uh, you name it, who would be working under one roof, trying to have an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach uh, to handling issues of, uh, of governance and anti-corruption. Because we are convinced that uh, uh, governance and anti-corruption is an integral part of the development agenda, and without it, uh, we cannot uh, have development objectives that, are, that can be properly achieved and sustainable. Um, now, after having talked uh, about governance and anti-corruption, let me turn to the issue of uh, human rights. Um, we all know that bilateral and international development institutions are increasingly recognizing the interconnection between human rights and development and the potential ways uh, each may impact the others. International human rights have had a profound impact on development thinking over the past 20 years. I've mentioned earlier the writings of Amartya Sen, but also Martha Nussbaum. Uh, they both, their work exemplified the influence of human rights paradigm in promoting a vision of poor people as free, active, and autonomous agents who should be empowered uh, by the development process and not subordinated as the passive recipients of charitable donations. Human rights principles such as voice, accountability, equality, inclusion, participation are now central to the development discourse. Um, if uh, uh, you look at uh, the, our World Bank legal review that, uh, that you mentioned at the beginning, um, all the past, I think, three issues have been dealing with some of these principles. And these are human rights principles, but they have been so accepted in the development discourse that you know, people are guided by them. They will not refer to you know, uh, Article X of this particular convention, but the principles that underlies those provisions are what, are what is guiding, actually, our work in these, uh, in these areas. Um, at, at the same time, development assistance itself is playing an extremely significant role in the realization of human rights through helping build the capacities of right holders to claim their rights and hold duty bearers to account. Um, Therefore, we as development organizations support the realization of uh, uh, economic and social rights. When we, for example, work in development operations in sectors such as health, education, water, safety nets, agriculture, finance, justice, you name it, um, we are in areas that are covered by international human rights law. And uh, here again, a point of convergence can be seen because by facilitating the achievement of development goals such as healthcare, education, jobs, or social welfare, development helps realize the rights that are underpinning them. Despite this linkage, linkage, however, there is still a significant challenge of coherent alignment between human rights and development and the appropriate integration of human rights consideration by our various international actors. At the core of this approach will be questions of on how to ensure that development interventions bring the maximum benefit to the poor and do not cause harm, how to ensure that people are at the center of the development process, that they have a voice in development interventions that affect their lives and are empowered to influence those development in interventions, how to ensure that development does not result in discrimination or increases inequalities or foster conflicts and how to promote accountability for the rights of those affected by development. These questions necessarily include how to ensure that human rights violations do not cripple the development process. But the task, this task of aligning uh, human rights to development is enormous, and a great deal still remains to be done. Nevertheless, um, as I mentioned, a positive development is uh, the evolving, the, 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 the the, the, the convergence that has developed um, at least at the level of the overarching goals and, and, and principles. And again, let me come back to, to Amartya Sen because he has just been so, so, so important in this area. Uh, we were in a paradigm where 
um, development was regarded from the narrow perspective of, you know, economic. It was the word economic that really uh, 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 was um, uh, the driving uh, dimension here. But by reframing it as freedom, he expanded uh, the, entire, the entire area. So he has argued that political and social freedoms are both inherently valuable and conducive to economic, uh, economic growth. Um, and drawing on this line of reasoning, one could easily say that human rights are relevant to development, not only for instrumental reasons, but they are intrinsically valuable to development in the same way as was argued about equity in our World Development Report in 2006, uh, the World Bank issued the uh, Equity and Development World Development Report. And this link between human rights and development um, is increasingly evident at the level of international political commitment, such as in the areas of the Millennium Development Goals and aid effectiveness. The 2000 Millennium Declaration, as well as the 2020, uh, 2010 World Summit Outcome Document, emphasize the centrality of human rights to sustainable development. And the discourse on the UN Sustainable Development Goals includes similar strands. This was reaffirmed in the outcome document of uh, the 2012 UN Conference on Sustainable Development, Rio Plus 20, which highlighted the need for sustainable development and, and poverty eradication to foster human rights. In the context of aid effectiveness, again, all the major instruments, the major uh, documents refer to it, the 20, 2008 Accra Agenda for Action or the 2011 Busan outcome document. I should also mention something that was uh, uh, um, quite interesting to see in 2012. For the first time, uh, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution on the rule of law, which declared that the rule of, that rule of law and development are strongly interrelated and mutually reinforcing, and emphasized that at the national and in, in the international level, rule of law is essential for sustained and inclusive economic growth, sustainable development, the eradication of poverty and hunger, and the full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the right to development. So in, the, in, uh, in a manner analogous to the international response to corruption and the quest for good governance, the legal response to human rights crisis and the plight of vulnerable people have similarly been global, with significant transboundary implication. And also this is evident in the nine universal treaties adopted by the UN and the host of regional instruments, which evidence a fundamental commitment to addressing human rights challenges collectively and cooperatively based on shared values and principle. In the context of international financial institutions, my, my, my own institution included, um, it has been a challenge operationally to do it. We agree at the level of the, of the principles. We have incorporated human rights uh, dimension into uh, the discourse, into how we do things. But um, the response has been, um, has been varied. Um, in some cases, development organizations have an explicit mandate to promote human rights in their work, but others, like the World Bank, do not. But even for those that don't have it in their mandate, may, through their work on a daily basis, support the realization of human rights, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, our mandate, to be specific, our mandate as World Bank is guided by the twin goals of eradicating poverty, extreme poverty, and boosting shared prosperity. And we do that through lending operations, advisory work, knowledge services, and uh, it helps us support the realization of uh, numerous rights embodied in, in, in international human rights instruments. Um, but as we speak, human rights are a very, very live issue um, at the World Bank. Um, as some of you know, we are going through a review of our safeguards process. And as part of the review of the, our, that safeguard process, there is a very, very intense debate going on inside the institution with our shareholders, but also external stakeholders around the world. It is difficult for me to comment on it because these are, this, this is just too 
too live in a sense and a bit too hot with all sort of uh, uh, sensitivities around it. But um, suffice it to say uh, that uh, the World Bank um, is clearly, uh, has clearly accepted uh, the importance of human rights in its development work and is trying to find ways uh, to integrate it more while remaining mindful of the limitations that are in its charter and which, uh, which uh, uh, many of you as lawyers will, will understand. Just a few words about uh, leveraging the, linking, the linkage between governance, anti-corruption, human rights, and development. Um, as I mentioned, uh, development um, actors are increasingly recognizing the linkage between these three and the direct operational relevance of their composite principles to securing better, fairer, and more accountable development processes and outcome. Um, as I mentioned, corruption often goes hand in hand with abuses of rights and denial of freedoms and helps shield abusers from accountability. The question of whether corruption violates human rights is, however, still contested, but there is a growing literature evidencing an interconnection. Um, I would like to mention a Transparency International report uh, with the International Council on Human Rights entitled Corruption and Human Rights Making the Connection, which has argued that the cycle of corruption facilitates, perpetuates, and institutionalizes human rights violation. And the report pointed out also that where corruption is widespread, states cannot comply, to, comply with their human rights obligation. This point can be supported by assertion made by some scholars that life, dignity, and other important values depend on a government free of corruption. I mentioned also the Sierra Leone example earlier. It is a, a good example of uh, seeing that uh, there is this connection. Um, corruption is visible in the abuse of power by the nurse and the demand that is placed on the victims to offer cups of rice before they are given access uh, to an otherwise free health benefit. These acts of corruption on different levels can be seen to have far-reaching effect on the women's and children's rights to health, right to food, and right to life. This in turn affects the achievement of the intended development outcome and indeed the realization of broader development objective, including the Millennium Development Goals number four and number five, which are about reducing child, infant, child mortality and improving maternal health. So in conclusion, I would say uh, rethinking international development uh, requires first and foremost uh, recognizing that the world has changed a lot. The world of 1945, when the World Bank, the IMF, and many other organizations were created, that world has changed a lot. Uh, so a concept that was created at the time uh, also needs to evolve with, uh, with new times. Uh, we do therefore need a fresher look at the lenses through which the global community has analyzed issues of poverty, and economic development. In the same way as technology has allowed human, humans to connect more with each other across boundaries, we need to find new ways of developing a commonality of language, a commonality of concepts, tools, approaches, and you added methodology when we just had a little conversation about these things, that would allow uh, people across disciplines, ideologies and, ideologies and beliefs to respond to the challenge of development in our times. To me, rethinking development simply means learning to put aside our differences or learning to be enriched by our differences to work for a greater good of simply ensuring that every human being on this planet can live in dignity and in freedom. It seems to be a tremendously difficult task to achieve it, and all of us are struggling about it. Uh, but I like to be inspired by the late President Mandela who said, it, is always, it always seems impossible until it is done. Thank you very much for your attention.